In case you haven't noticed, well-being and wellness have been hijacked by those selling modern-day versions of snake oil. Pseudoscience, social media's candy, is winning the clicks game over actual science, and your friends are more likely to send you a YouTube video as, in quote, proof of their claim than a credible, peer-reviewed research study. Enter Dr. Jonathan Stay, author of the new book, Mind the Science. He is a full-time practicing clinical psychologist specializing in the assessment and treatment of addiction and mental disorders and is also an adjunct assistant professor of psychology at the University of Calgary. He's battling the ridiculous pseudoscience claims and keeping his sense of humor through all the anger sent his way on X and elsewhere. Our longtime listeners know we originally started this podcast seven years ago specifically to try to bring the evidence back to health and wellness. So... We're grateful to people like Dr. Stay who are willing to do the same in spite of the constant pushback. Thank you for joining us on the Catalyst 360 podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brad Cooper of Catalyst Coaching. And if you're an employer or an EAP looking to move beyond generic coaching for employees, Catalyst Coaching 360 has been the best in class leader since 2007 and recently recognized by Fortune Magazine as the number one coaching training provider in the country. In addition, you can now access a range of specialty coaching options, including tobacco cessation, lifestyle support to complement the use of GLP-1 meds, as well as our Catalyst Elite Resilience and Mental Toughness Coaching for executives and high performers. All the details at CatalystCoaching360.com, or please reach out anytime you'd like. Results at CatalystCoaching360.com. And now, it's time to kick the tires on the world of pseudoscience with Dr. Jonathan Stay on the latest episode of the Catalyst 360 podcast. Well, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. I got to tell you, if anybody's having a rough day, they just pull up your Twitter account, read uh, through your responses to the hassles you're getting, and it just it just brings joy to your day. So so thank you for taking that approach. I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I assume that you're meaning one of the hundreds of abusive oh. messages that I receive oh. daily on social media, which has been ongoing for a few years now. So, yeah, I, I find it. Um, well, I won't lie. In, in the beginning, years ago, it was a bit discombobulating, but then <sighs> you become well practiced at managing it. So now it's just sort of uh, part of the process. Well, let's start there. We're, we're going to get into pseudoscience. We love the fact you're doing this. The reason we started this doggone podcast seven years ago was there's so much baloney in health and wellness, and that's our world. And we wanted to do our best to try to keep the focus on the evidence. So we're psyched to have you. It's going to be a lot of fun. But, but literally, how do you deflect that in the quiet moments? Because I think one of my later questions we can dig into a little bit more is the coaches that are legit, that are nationally board certified, they're getting pushed, A, by competitors who are throwing out the baloney and making these big promises that are ridiculous, and they're trying to trying to save with the science, or just the average person that that they hear these things and their friends are talking about it. I, I don't know. You're, you're getting hammered. We're only getting to see the best of it. You're having fun with it. You're playing around with it. It, it brings humor to our lives. But how are you really dealing with it? Yeah, I mean, I, I try, like you said, I, I try to find the humor in the absurdity of it all. Um, and often what you see is, I mean, people, this is what I, I like to tell people who are kind of new to science communication and they kind of email me and they, because it can be really um, isolating at first to be just bombarded with a lot of hate and people just yes. really take it personally and it can really, it can hurt people and it literally chases people off social media um, and off just science communication in general, right. whether you're publishing an article and you're reading comments and newspapers and things like that. So it can be bad. But um, what I tell people is, and what really helps me is at the end of the day, it, I think what we have to realize is that most of these people, the vast majority don't, number one, they don't know who you are. And so mm -hmm. they're really attacking an idealized cartoonish version of who they think you are and really they're attacking ideas they're not really attacking you i mean they may they may, may make fun of my hair they go after your personal characteristics but at the end of the day they don't it's not you they're, they're attacking ideas and it kind of taps into that tribalism part of our psychology that they're really going after it's like democrats going after republicans conservatives going after liberals similar sort of idea different sports teams i mean at the end of the day when you attack someone on the opposite team you're not attacking them 
them. You're attacking the team and what they represent and what they symbolize. And I think when science communicators can kind of wrap their heads around that, it helps to depersonalize it. And I think that's kind of liberating. Now, you've been working on this book. The book's titled Mind the Science. We'll have a link to it in the, the description. You've been working on this for a couple of years, but you've been taking on this battle for much longer. Walk us through the process of, I'm going to get this out here. It's just part of who I am, what I'm doing, part of my research, et cetera, to the transition over to, I'm going big with this. I, I, I'm going to I'm going to jump all in and, and get this book out here as well. Yeah, I'd appreciate that. Like I, my my day job, my my nine to five is a clinician. I'm a clinical psychologist, so I work in a hospital clinic, an outpatient clinic, where we see people who experience really severe concurrent addiction and mental disorders. And so that's what I've been doing for over a decade. Um, before that, though, during my graduate school work. And my research was really focused on can the nature of cannabis addiction and mm. recovery from cannabis use disorders. And so, yeah, and when I was doing that work, I noticed a lot of myths and misinformation around cannabis. You know, in what way uh, is it an addiction? Is it similar to opioid addictions and alcohol addictions? Uh, people are hearing things like, ah, oh, it's just natural. It's not even a drug. Can you even get addicted? And so these were myths that I saw kind of embedded in our culture because there's a subculture around cannabis. But I also, through my own clinical work and just seeing patients working in addiction settings, I would see the substantial minority of people who do happen to get addicted to cannabis. So the vast majority of people who use cannabis don't get addicted, just like the vast majority of people who drink don't get addicted to alcohol. But there is a minority, and it's a substantial minority because these substances are so widely used. And those are the people that would come to clinic and they would come with these myths and misinformation and it would confuse them and it would affect how they see themselves. And so initially that that's what brought me into science communication was I, I wanted to write articles and op-eds um, in the news, just kind of debunking like top five cannabis myths yeah. or something like that. And then I took to social media. When I got to social media, I was kind of blown away. I'm like, wow, <laughs> this information <laughs> extends way beyond <laughs> cannabis addiction. It extends to not just addiction, not just mental health, but just health in general. And so that really just kind of took me on this journey. And then I think with COVID-19, you know, four years ago, it just blew the landscape wide open and we saw even more misinformation in pseudoscience. And so that's that's what got me there. And then after just years of people just battling kind of in the trenches of social media, so to speak, and people asking me things like, you know, Jonathan, is this article legitimate? Is this a pseudoscience? Is this guy a quack, et cetera? I, and I, I learned so much along the way, I decided to kind of localize it all, compile it all in one spot. And that's what kind of, that was that was the impetus for the book. Interesting. And you've taken a, a focus in your book on the mental health side. Is that Due to, hey, I've been doing this. This is what I do in my, as you described, nine to five. Was that the reason? Or do you feel like, doggone it, that's where it's hitting us the hardest. That's where the most damage is taking place. Because you could have gone any direction with this when it comes to pseudoscience. Totally. I, I think I think there's so many different areas. Um, I did take the mental health angle primarily because that is my area of expertise. I don't try to speak beyond that as, as much as I can. I don't want to step beyond my scope. But yeah, I'm a clinical psychologist. It's my nine to five. Um, and that's what I've been living and breathing daily for, what well, I don't even know, 15, 20, 20 years now, who knows. Um, and so I, I did notice that um, there was a huge gap too. Like there's a lot of you know, we have a great army of science communicators out there trying to debunk mental health, mis or just trying to debunk misinformation and pseudoscience. But I didn't notice a whole lot in the mental health space. That was sort of a gap and um, a gap that I kind of wanted to seize upon and try to help out with. And I'm thinking about when it comes to pseudoscience, it's almost like there's this huge bell curve. You've got the you've got the crazy people. But you also have the scientists who are, and let's leave names off the table for this conversation, but you have the, the scientists who are grabbing a minute discovery and then extrapolating it to the nth degree to create protocols and clicks and uh, suggestions for the listener who's seeing both of those. Like, are, are there are there similar approaches 
for both ends of the spectrum. The obviously, oh my word, are you kidding me person? And the very frankly credible individual who's just taking it too far. Yeah, we won't name names, but no. I have an idea. <laughs> there's, there's several on the top of my head. Yes, absolutely. Um, but no, I hear you, uh, you know, and, and just pseudoscience itself and, you know, and misinformation itself, it does kind of, like you said, fall on a bell curve or it falls on a spectrum. Um, there's the unequivocal, clear instances. Um, and then there's the kind of that middle gray zone, which is a lot tougher. And so in the mental health space, it's things like, you know, cannabis use, for example, is sure. it helpful or harmful for mental health or psychedelics or mindfulness meditation, things like that. And then at the extremes, you have things like energy healing and homeopathy, which are just scientifically implausibly ludicrous. And so for the average reader, though, or the average layperson, um, this the same set of skills, I think, are are required. I mean, we want to one thing that I try to do in the book is trying to teach people to look for pseudo scientific warning signs um, and to try to teach the language of pseudo scientific grift and wellness influencer grifts um, and alternative medicine kind of more generally kind of its ideology. Um, but yeah, it can be very difficult when you get credible scientists or credible health professionals also kind of pushing that stuff. So um, I, I, I kind of lay out different kinds of warning signs that people can look for, different tropes, which are kind of repeated ideas or themes that people can try to identify that should get people's spidey senses up, so to speak, just put their, make them a bit more wary. Um, an important point, I think, when analyzing these things, because you, like you said, some of these scientists that are legitimate, they will take a, a real scientific paper or study, right. like an animal study, and right. then just hype it up and blow it out of proportion to the point that it's sort of, um, well, it just loses its meaning and sort of its merit. Um, and one thing that I think is important to understand about pseudoscience is that we talk about it as if it's this one thing, but like we said, it's sort of a spectrum. And I think the most helpful way to think about pseudoscience is that it's sort of a, it's a probabilistic endeavor. So the more warning signs that we see and that we hear, the more likely it is that we are going to unearth something pseudoscientific. So it's not any particular warning sign. It's not just that there's an animal study or just the use of anecdotal evidence. It's sort of a constellation of these warning signs. And the more that we see, that can really make us be skeptical and say, well, maybe something's not right about this. But I, I empathize with the average person when you get a really legit professor scientist who you know has got a wide audience and they're talking about studies and they're using sciencey sounding language um it can be really really tough and so I, I think that it's important to kind of fall on the scientific consensus of the community so to speak um, but that can be hard we don't even know how to find some of those things yeah and then and then there's a the whole placebo stuff which like it or not Makes a difference. Uh, how do you view the value of placebo? Or do you put that in a completely separate category and you say, look, we got to start with the science. Let's follow the science. And hey, if there's something that's not harmful that creates a positive placebo, knock yourself out. But, or w kind of what is your mindset with that or, or your guidance with that? It's, it's such a great question because placebo effects exist in both mainstream medicine and alternative yeah, medicine. Absolutely. We know that. Um, the problem is that it's the way in which these things are marketed. So, and that's what I try to make clear in the book is that alternative medicine isn't just a set of unsupported treatments or pseudoscientific treatments. It's more than that. It's an entire ideology and it's a narrative. It has its own propaganda tactics and its own tropes to kind of control audiences. So for example, if someone were to Google, say a local alternative medicine website, um, you will be able to see some of these tropes. And it's the narrative is sort of a, it's a divisive polarizing narrative that sort of tries to berate and split from mainstream medicine. So you'll, th you'll see things like, unlike mainstream medicine, we address the root cause and we treat the root cause versus mainstream medicine, which just tackles the symptoms. And our, our treatments are all natural and that they're safe versus your synthetic big pharma kind of stuff. And so like the, this is the kind of narrative that I think is dangerous because it's basically false advertising. Um, when it comes to 
placebo effects. I mean, of course, a lot of alternative medicine treatments can be what sometimes people call placebo theater, right? You go in and and your alternative medicine practitioners capitalize on a placebo effect. And that's really great. Um, and it's fine. However, when it comes to marketing, if they marketed themselves as this is a placebo, that's a different story, but that's not what they're doing. They're saying that their treatments can treat your post-traumatic stress disorder or their depression or your anxiety disorders. And the reason they can do that is due to the active ingredients or the, or their, is due to their treatments. It's not due to the placebo effect. And that is deceptive. And, and I think that when we, that, that, that doesn't even, in my opinion, doesn't respect patient autonomy, because if you want to get real about informed consent and patient autonomy, you want to be forthright about the risks and benefits of treatment. And so if I were to, and I wouldn't, but if I were to offer, say, an unequivocal pseudoscientific treatment like energy healing, which purports to, you know, something like Reiki, where I can use my hands to without touching someone, manipulate the human energy fields around them, which we know doesn't exist, because if those things existed, it would fundamentally undermine our understanding of physics and anatomy and biology. So we know these things don't exist, but that's how these alternative medicine practitioners are pitching them. So at the informed consent process, if I were to be very honest with that, I would have to say, look, I'm going to offer you some energy healing, but it doesn't work beyond the placebo effect. And there are other treatments that can work that are more effective and have more evidence behind them. And of course, that doesn't happen. So that I think encouraging an approach to healthcare merely relying on placebo effects is deceptive unless you're being forthright about it, and we don't see that. What is it about we want the secret? Now, I, I think it's obvious with elite athletes, yeah. high execs that are just go, go, go. They feel like you know what I, I'm. I'm got the basics. What's what's the missing link that'll put me ahead of my competitors? But it's not just that group. Those groups. It's it seems like it's different. I had a buddy the other day sent me a text. What do you think about X Y Z? I'm like, well, we can talk about it. But are you sleeping? Are you active? Are you eating the basics? Are you connecting with the people important to you? Like, let's let's address the ninety eight percent. Before we get concerned, but people don't seem to care about the 98%. They care about the 0.2% that maybe is out there somewhere. What, what's up with that? Yeah, I think I think getting back, you're speaking to the basics, right? So yeah, self-care, the eating well, yeah. sleeping well, yeah. um, connecting with community, all of those things. Yeah, I mean, those are, those are fundamental. Um, those are fundamental parts of all healthcare. One thing that sort of... Um, grinds my gears, so to speak, about the alternative medicine narrative is that they, in that narrative of trying to alienate from alienate mainstream medicine, they'll try to say that that is sort of under their purview and that mainstream medicine doesn't do that. Um, to be fair, I get there's kernels of truth in that because, you know, sure. five to 10 minute family physician appointments don't cut it and dangerously long wait lists to see specialists doesn't cut it. At the same time, you know, I've been running a self-care group where we talk about sleep and nutrition. I've been running this group weekly for a decade. And so I'm in mainstream mental health care, and this is an important part of recovery from addiction and mental health concerns. So, you know, mainstream medicine does it. It doesn't actually fall under the purview of alternative medicine, but they try to hijack it. And when I notice what they're doing is it's sort of a one of the propaganda tactics is what we call a bait and switch. So they'll, they'll kind of lure people in by saying mainstream medicine doesn't talk about nutrition and exercise, um, you know, and diet, et cetera. We do. And then they'll get the foot in the door and then they'll switch to offering some sort of pseudoscientific treatment, like an unsupported supplement or God knows what else. And so... Yeah, I think I think part of the, you know, what's the what's missing, I think that's due to just the the mere fact that we don't understand a lot of a lot of things about health. I mean, that science is an evolving process. Our healthcare systems are imperfect. We know that, especially in areas like mental health, which is very complicated and, you know, the chronic disease area, chronic pain. We don't have a lot of answers for these things, and mainstream medicine does fall short and we wish it didn't. At the same time, wellness grift and alternative medicine grift isn't the solution. It's sort of, and, and, the, and I think that that's what allows grifters or wellness influencers to kind of slither in and open for business because they notice that obviously mainstream medicine can't meet everyone's needs, but it doesn't mean that they can right. by offering just bullshit, so to speak. Right. 
You, you share a, a somewhat humorous story in your book about a conversation between Bill Mayer and Larry King about the difference between germ theory and terrain theory. Can, can you help our listeners understand what the difference is and why it's central to understanding the science literacy? Yeah, I mean, germ theory is something, again, before social media, I didn't know that people could deny that viruses existed. So <laughs> this, was a, this is a longstanding 160-year-old debate that's been going on. Not a debate. It was a debate 160 years right. ago. Right, right, between right. Debate's <laughs> over. <laughs> the debate's over. Yeah, germ theory won, so to speak, in that there, you know, it was Louis Pasteur versus um, Bayshamp. And they just, they, they just were trying to figure out what are the different origins of, of sickness and, and, you know, Pasteur found out that we do have, there's things like bacteria and viruses and they can cause disease. The, and what we see now on social media is that in, in, it's very, it's almost like a, it started off as a subculture of the anti-vaccine movement where people are denying that viruses actually exist and that germs actually exist. But since social media, especially in the COVID-19 era, era, it's really blown up to, it's just becoming a lot more prevalent. Like I'm seeing it in my mentions, so to speak, or in my threads, at least weekly. And I don't know if these are bots, if these are actual humans, but these are people that actually uh, are promoting this kind of propaganda. And so the terrain is is that the body matters too. So for example, like, you know, our environment, right? So what we eat, what we put into our bodies, um, how we exercise, and that this will also affect health. And so the reality is that both are true to some extent. Um, but to, to outright deny that germs exist is just absolute conspiracy level denial. Yeah. 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 All right. You highlight, and we can't go through all of them, but Pick a few of these out. Nine red flags of pseudoscience. Can you pick out a few of your favorites? A few that you say, you know, these rise to the top. These keep bubbling up that we, especially as, as our listeners are tapping into this, they say, oh, wasn't aware of that. Hadn't heard of that one. Totally. So one we kind of touched on, I think, I think this one is the most important one for separating the wheat from the shaft, so to speak, in terms of differentiating those unequivocal instances of pseudoscience versus the gray zone. And the warning sign is called, it's called the claims divorced from the broader scientific literature. So what that means is when you see a claim that is so outlandish that nothing else in the scientific literature agrees with it, that's a pseudoscientific warning sign. So for example, the energy fields that I mentioned in energy healing or, or human uh, human energy fields. Like we just know that no matter how much there, there's no, there's no way if you, if we have a, say a randomized control trial and it shows say that uh, energy healing treatments work compared to something else compared to placebo, the, it, what that does is it highlights the challenge of doing clinical research more than it does to the purported mechanisms of that treatment meaning there's no way that I can manipulate your human energy fields. It's just not possible. If that were to be true, everything that we know about human anatomy, it would just crumble. Similarly, in the example of homeopathy, which is a particular kind of treatment, um, just to, to simplify things, homeopathy posits that water has memory for molecules. So homeopathic solution or homeopathic remedy doesn't actually have any active ingredients in it. It just dilutes a substance to the point that not a single molecule is left. And instead, according to homeopathy, the water remembers the last remnant of that molecule. And that's what's supposed to be helpful or, or an active ingredient. So we know that scientifically, that's just, it's insane. It just can't happen. And so that's one of the warning signs is that when you see a a, a pseudoscientific treatment that's claiming an outlandish claim like that, where something like past life regression therapy says, I can treat your post-traumatic stress disorder by regressing you through hypnosis to a past life, like the 1200s when you were a peasant. Well, you know, that, that depends on reincarnation. And so these are just scientifically implausible ideas. So that's one huge pseudoscientific warning sign that can really um, carve out a lot of, can really differentiate the, the wheat from the chaff. Another important one, I think, is the use of anecdotal evidence to support claims. I think this is a huge one. 
um, meaning just a lot of testimonials. It's not, again, it's not the all, none of these signs in isolation can say something is pseudoscientific, but when you see a lot of anecdotal evidence supporting a treatment, that's, um, that's a red flag. So for example, you go on someone's website and they say, you know, Bob is saying that quantum neurological reset therapy can help with his depression. It's that Bob is endorsing it, Karen's endorsing it, Susan's endorsing it, but it's not any particular studies. It's just a, it's a, an anonymous or a person claiming it. That's, um, that's not true. And we just know from research one one that, you know, an N of one can't really tell you whether a treatment works because it can't infer things like causality. So that's a very, um, big pseudoscientific warning sign so much to the point that psychologists like myself um, it's actually unethical for psychologists to post testimonials on their website mm. for for making claims about the treatments that they offer so it's actually been dubbed yes it's, it goes against our ethical codes versus a, a wellness influencer you won't really find that so that's a huge one and then i'd say that maybe a last favorite is that that sciencey sounding language that I mentioned, um, that's a hallmark. So like a quantum neurological reset therapy will rewire the brain's cellular mechanisms by going down to the quantum level. So like what I just said makes no sense. It's it's very it sounds impressive, but maybe maybe it doesn't. To me it doesn't. <laughs> but if you go on if you go onto particular websites, like you'll you'll find that kind of jargon and that kind of use of science to it's, it's essentially a manipulation tool to kind of coax people into believing that their treatments actually have science behind them when they don't. And so quantum is a huge one. Just the word quantum, like it's it's becoming a huge thing. Quantum neurological reset therapy or or quantum biology or quantum X, Y, and Z. And I find that so absurd because, you know, the legendary physicist Richard Feynman says, if if you think you understand quantum mechanics, then you don't. And that's because quantum mechanics is incredibly difficult and complex and it's counterintuitive and it's very obscure. And it's that obscurity that lends itself to the, the hands of, of grifters, so to speak, that kind of capitalize on that. And they can say, well, I can treat your 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 post-traumatic stress disorder with this quantum treatment. and for a lay person who doesn't know any better, they're not going to be able to question that. And so I think that's why it's so important to help people improve their science literacy skills, because if we can know just basic level of science, knowing that quantum mechanics is really hard. So if I have an uh, alternative medicine practitioner telling me they can treat my depression with a quantum therapy, they probably don't know what they're talking about because the physicists have a tough time with quantum physics, not your random alternative medicine <laughs> practitioner. <laughs> All right. That's a great introduction. Now, how let's get into the practical. How can the everyday individual, somebody who doesn't spend their day in the lab, doesn't spend their day reviewing research, learn or step into the mode of thinking scientifically? It's a great question. I think it's so it's hard. And so that's what I try to do in my book was try to give people kind of some of these tools. I try to help them speak teach that language of pseudoscientific grift, um, because I think that's its own language. But science literacy itself, um, you know, it, it involves just becoming more familiar and aware of what science actually is. The term science literacy can kind of be um, broken down into, into three different ways. Like it's really about the accumulated accumulated facts or kind of content of science. So like knowing about evolution or knowing about climate change or knowing about vaccines, things like that. Um, another dimension to science literacy is knowing about its processes. So things like differences between correlation and causation and the nature of probability um, and, and kind of getting familiar with its vocabulary, like randomized control trials. And then the third kind of component to science literacy is understanding it really is a social process. Um, so how it's done, like how do we actually do science, how to how do professors or scientists submit studies to peer-reviewed scientific journals? Um, what are conflicts of interest? Those sorts of things. And it's hard for an everyday person to do that. And I totally get it. There's science literacy courses. There's a great one out of the University of Alberta that's free and online. It's called, it's a science literacy course. I often post it on my social media. Um, so that's one way to do it. Another way is to and this is hard because the scientific spirit is about being humble and, and being skeptical of claims. And at the same time, we also have to 
learn how to trust credible expertise. And that can be a tough thing too. So like finding organizations that are actually legit and credible. So in psycho- in mental health, that's the American Psychological Association or the Canadian Psychological Association. And if you go to their websites, they'll have things like fact sheets and um, and kind of resources for people to learn about the nature of mental disorders. So that this is trying to help people learn, you know, improve their mental health literacy, which is a kind of science literacy. So I get it. it it's, it's a tough terrain to navigate. Google Scholar obviously is a starting point for folks. Um, and yet there's the predatory journals out there that allow you to create a study that doesn't have many of the elements you just described. Mm-hmm. So let's say somebody says, wait, what's this thing? Google Scholar. And they pull it up and they're like, oh, wow, this is cool. I can pull up real studies. Now what? How? how what's that next step to screen out the ones that are seen as actual studies published, pseudo at least peer reviewed from, you, you know what I'm saying? Like what, what, how yes. can somebody, let's just give them a basic lesson here on how can they take that next step from, okay, I got a study now. It's not a YouTube video. And is it legit? And I know you're not, you don't have an easy answer to that, but is there a starting mm-hmm. point where folks can begin to filter a little bit? It's so hard. I wish I had an easy map. Again, I think it does come back to back to those pseudoscientific warning signs and just trying to, you know, read with a skeptical lens. But it it is so hard. We're seeing papers retracted all the time. Yeah, like there was just one another today, one. Yeah. And, yeah, just another one today. Um one of the one of the, the most difficult things or one of the the most difficult or insidious propaganda tactics that I think alternative medicine uses, which scares the crap out of me, to be honest, is that, and and so you mentioned that there's these predatory journals. So these are journals that will charge author fees to publish. They may obviate the peer review process. They don't even have peer reviewers or maybe one or two, but then there's these journals that publish on unequivocal pseudoscientific topics and they look like legit science, like you're saying. So I have one that I mentioned in the book where they they did a randomized controlled trial on on sending the, the idea was that if you send positive vibes to water you can make its ice crystals look more beautiful like something ridiculous like that or there's another journal that actually entertained the idea that demonic possession could be an explanation for schizophrenia and these are published in journals. They have an introduction session, they have a method section, they have a results and a discussion, and they that's what makes it pseudoscience. It's dressed up like science. It looks legit. And so it's hard for the everyday person to kind of navigate that because the I guess the answer to your question is to, again, just kind of try to gain a basic understanding of, 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 of improving your science literacy skills and your mental health literacy skills because taking any one study out of context, you could find a study to support any kind of conclusion that you want if you hype it up and generalize it to the point of absurdity. So, yeah, again, it, it's trying to trying to again, get these really fundamentals down to help navigate that um, that terrible space of, of pseudoscientific journals. That isn't going away. Uh, let's step a little bit heavier into the mental illness side. You use a wonderful phrase, the invisible bruise, when you're talking about mental illness. Can you flesh that out for us a little bit and, and what that means and why it's so, to me, it was a powerful phrase. Yeah, I love that phrase too. It, it's not mine. It's from someone I, who I mentioned in the book. Uh, her name is Hannah Blum, and she she's an individual who uh, experiences bipolar disorder, and she's uh, a person with lived experience who advocates um, for decreasing mental illness stigma through her art and through writing. And so, yeah, I think she wrote such a beautiful thing there. The invisible bruise to me basically means something like um well like someone with mental illness the the suffering is inside it's invisible we can't there's no cast on your head or on your body like a broken arm or or anything so it's very it's the, the suffering is invisible to some extent i mean because people can't really see it and you can put on a mask say if someone's 
experiencing depression or, or again, post-traumatic stress disorder, people can smile and go, go on about their day, but it doesn't really capture what's happening when they go home at night and when they're, you know, or even on the bus or in the car and, you know, how they're experiencing those, those really devastating mental health symptoms or mental illness symptoms. Um, so the idea is that, I guess, with the invisible bruise is that, um, well, stigma can be, stigma can make mental health worse because when, when we don't have a good understanding of mental disorders and their treatment, um, I think this is what Hannah Blum writes. I mean, she says that uh, that can really impact someone's health, mental health in a negative way. You get guys like Andrew Tate on Twitter or X who are tweeting to millions of people, hundreds of millions of people that depression doesn't exist. And then it's just for, he, he, I'm quoting him, he says, fat, lazy men. Like, that's just absurd. So um, that's what we mean by stigma, and that can be an an invisible bruise. So stigma is sort of a discrimination or or, um, a a set of negative attitudes towards someone, and that that stigma can be embedded in our culture. And part of mental health literacy is learning how to um, decrease stigma to kind of make it more, make people more aware of the nature of mental disorders and what they mean um, so that we can all have be more compassionate for people that suffer. And a lot of uh, probably every one of your listeners either has experienced mental health concerns or know someone who has, whether a friend or a loved one. Yeah, yeah no doubt. Um, your concept of how we think in shortcuts rather than algorithms, I think would be super valuable for our listeners that, that are trying to do this filtering process. Talk us through the difference between the shortcuts and the algorithms and how maybe we can flip the switch a little bit. Totally. It's the idea that, just to to simplify it, it's the idea that our brains are wired for shortcuts. And that's because... It's efficient. It's efficient, exactly. Evolutionarily speaking, there's so much information in our environment. Like, how do we know what to pay attention to? I'm trying to pay attention to this podcast, but I notice your wonderful background, you know, the plant, the different shades. Like, my brain doesn't know how... It can't process all that stuff. So it needs to be efficient. It needs to just focus on what's relevant in the moment. And so um, our brains are sort of wired for that and it's efficient and it's got us to the evolutionary point that we are and that we are able to survive. The problem is that they can also go awry and that's, um, that's, that's a problem because sometimes the information that we're missing could be really helpful for us. And so um, I talk a bit about it in the, in the book, but again, it's not, these aren't, this isn't a new idea. It derives from uh, Daniel Kahneman's work, who won a Nobel Prize, we have different styles of thinking, right? We have our intuitive style of thinking and our analytical style of thinking. Um, so the the intuitive is just sort of this really fast, short kind of um, effortless kind of um, gut instinct to information, whether we believe it or not. And then our analytical is just a more slowed, focused um analyzing what's actually in front of us. And there's a ton of research in in the misinformation space that says that people who are more susceptible to misinformation tend to rely more on that intuitive thinking style. And so the antidote is to, again, slow down, pay attention to accuracy and just... um, and and try to activate that that part of our brain that that is a bit more deliberate so yeah uh, you know our our those those shortcuts can get us into trouble another favorite one of mine is um there's this idea of the illusory truth effect which is that when we again this derives from daniel common's work when we see pieces of information repeatedly over and over and over a shortcut that our brains use is that well maybe I should believe that because I'm hearing it. Right? Mm. Imagine if our peers and our family are saying it, then we probably should pay attention to it and believe it. However, that's an example of our brains going awry because just because we see something repeatedly doesn't mean that it's true. And so Daniel Kahneman said something like, our brains aren't good at differentiating familiarity with the truth. And that's and that's one of the reasons why misinformation on social media is so harmful. If we're repeatedly hearing something like, vaccines are killing people and they're harmful or that mental illness doesn't exist or that all psychiatric medications are harmful. 
we repeatedly hear that over and over and over, that's going to influence some people and to the extent that it can influence their health decisions. And that's, that's not a good thing. So again, all the more reason to slow down and activate that, that, um, that analytical style of thinking. So yes, it's important to slow down. And yet we're all running around with our hair on fire. <laughs> ah, I, I got to get this done, this done. I'm so busy. Yo, and now it's a badge of honor. I'm busy. Wow. You're amazing then. Cause you're busier than me. Um, how do we really do that? And, and, and you said it influences some of us it probably influences all of it. like that's, the people who are around, you become the five people you spend the most time with, is the old saying. And and certainly that gets elevated if we're, the person we're spending time with is X or Facebook or whatever. But can you give us some practical guidance on how do you really slow down? Like, yeah, I get it. Believe it. All, all, all in on the idea. And then as soon as the podcast is over, man, I got stuff to do. I'm moving forward. <laughs> I, uh, you know what I mean? I do. I do. And, and it's not just a problem on social media. It's even in the news, right? Like yeah. our, our social media news, our culture is wired, also not wired. It's, it's incentivizes and rewards, you know, sound bites, yep. emotion laden, it bleeds, it over, leads. oversimplified messaging. And so, yeah, I totally get it. How do we all, how do we actually slow down? I mean, that's a tough question. I, I think that it, it comes down to prioritizing and just becoming increasingly aware and making it a goal. I mean, it's a really hard thing to do, but it's like, if people really want to, it's almost like, it, I know you interviewed some people who do motivational interviewing work. Yeah. It's like, it's the same and kind Bill of Miller. thing. Yeah. And Bill Miller, right? So it's trying to find, if we really want to increase our motivation and our behavior for something, then you want to align it with your values. And to make it aligned with your values, you have to care about it and then do behavioral, small pieces of behavioral chunks to to make that a reality so for example if you want to slow down put it in your phone just as a daily reminder i'm going to so i'm going to take 10 minutes to do nothing today for 10 minutes or I'm, I'm just going to slow down i'm going to read some headlines and i'm going to i'm going to really focus and not just kind of not get into not just fall for the headline but really get into the study i'm going to go find it i'm going to go find the actual peer-reviewed study and analyze the the methods in the results section or just kind of see if i can get a bit deeper so all that to say anything that we really want to do we have to we have to prioritize it and that can be that in and of itself is hard because we're going to have competing values and competing goals and in some ways it it can almost feel more burdensome because it's like oh great now i got to add another task to my already to-do list but we teach that in mental health clinics and with patients all the time it's like we you need it's it's almost cliched the work life balance, but it's cliched for a reason. Like you need that because if you don't do that, people will burn out. And when we don't prioritize, like you said, our self care and our basics, then our mental health will suffer and our health will suffer. And so part of work life balance or prioritizing self care also means, if you want it to, slowing down to prioritize leisure and hobbies, which could be learning about science or learning about mental health or learning about um, learning about how to slow down like those. It's, it's almost like a, it's a meta thought. It's like I want to prioritize this thing. So I'm going to take steps to, to do that. Does it ever feel and we kind of dipped our toe in the water early with this in terms of the pushback that you're constantly getting the headwinds that you're going into? But in some ways, it almost feels helpless or hopeless to spend the time to do that because you might, I might, some of our listeners might, but the vast majority of our population won't and never will. And as a result, the currents are driven by those who don't take the time and we're going to get rushed away with those currents. I, I, I don't know. Is there... It just feels like, how do we, you brought up motivational interviewing we have with Stephen Rolnick and Bill, but I don't know. I, I'm just, as I'm hearing you talk, I, I'm nodding my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, and 3% of our listeners are going to take the time to do that. And the other 97% are going to, I don't know. You hear what I'm saying? 
I, I hear it loud and clear. Uh, it's it's something that it's an issue that I wrestled with as well. Even in the book, just more broadly, it's like I'm I'm, I'm basically trying to tackle the problem of pseudoscience and misinformation and how to protect people from it, particularly mental health misinformation. And the reason that people fall for misinformation and pseudoscience can happen. There's ways that there's lots of different interacting ways. And part of that, like you said, is it can happen at the social level. There's social media. There's our, our cult, our entire culture is just kind of flowing this way. And I don't, I wrestled with this question. Well, how do we change the trend? Right. And I don't have the answers at the social level because I don't want to feign expertise. Like I'm not a sociologist or a political scientist or a policy analyst. I'm, I'm a clinical psychologist. So I work with people at that individual level. And that's how I wrote the book was to try to really help people at an individual level. Um, and I'm hoping that we get enough people to, you know, strengthen their grift detectors, so to speak, that that can inevitably affect the demand of, in a negative way for them, of, of the whole, whole, you know, pseudoscientific wellness culture. But I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to, you know, energize um, a society or a nation, so to speak, to do it. It's really, I think it does come down to an individual and that's how, that's the level I'm trying to work at. Right. The one at a time. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Just a couple more. We talked about a lot of our listeners are board certified health and wellness coaches are heading that way when they're facing headwinds. So I mentioned, you know, they have co coaches. I'm putting quote marks up since folks can't see me, people that claim to be coaches, but haven't gone through the board certification process and they're selling the baloney very effectively, unfortunately, and taking opportunities away from those who have gone through the process. What advice do you have for them? Not, I mean, beyond hang in there, it'll turn the title, tour, anything else that we can give them in terms of, hey, what you're doing actually matters. It's going to take effect long term. And they're like, yeah, I got to pay my mortgage in the short term. And these folks are killing me on the revenue cycle. Yeah. I mean, I, for me, it comes down to ethics, right? It's like, do you want to make a living being a grifter? No. You want to make a living taking advantage of people and speaking beyond your scope and pretending you know how to do something that you don't feigning expertise i mean i know that 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 happens people can do it but that's not the life that i want to leave and that's what i would encourage i think a vast majority of people on the whole i try to you know see the the good side of humanity and, and you know the vast majority of people that get into help, helping professions are kind and caring souls and um i think part of that though is recognizing that in order to do that you need to have a certain level of expertise or um, accountability or, or yeah, just, just sort of expertise. I'd say you need, you need to ground what you're doing in a protocol and that that's an ethical way to treat people. And if you're not doing that and you're selling, you're selling crap, you're selling grift, you're selling false hope, that's not a good thing. And so for the person who is kind of trying to do their best with it, that's what I'd say. Like, you know, yeah, it's not really hang in there, but it's like, you know, try to find the inner value of what you're doing. Obviously we need to pay our bills and stuff too, but, um, but you, you want to do it right and, and ethically. Well, and I might add to that as you were talking, I was thinking, and long-term your route works, theirs does not. So they may be able to pull the wool over the, the customer for a month or six months, but the tools that you have in your toolbox with MI or, you know, whatever, intrinsic motivation, temp, whatever it is, that works. We know that works. We've, we've shown that works. So hang in there because it will pay off. All right. Last question. Let's just have some fun with this. What pseudoscience claims would be on the doctor's stay Mount Rushmore of ridiculousness? Oh, that's a great, <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> Of ridiculousness. Well, the, I, I think I mentioned one of like the the one that drives me bonkers is that is mental illness denial. Mm. So it's an, it, I I talk about it in the book. It's part of the anti psychiatry movement where you get people who are saying things like schizophrenia doesn't exist, or again Andrew Tate say, tweeting to millions of hundreds of millions of people depression doesn't exist. This stuff is ludicrous. I mean, it's 
it, it's really, really harmful. And it, it's it's more harmful because, again, it takes advantage. Like any propaganda, there's always kernels of truth, and then they blow up, they blow up lies. And so the kernel of truth is that the science of psychopathology is really hard, meaning we haven't perfect, we don't perfectly understand mental illness. We haven't Absolutely. carved nature at its joints, so to speak. And so people will point to the things like the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, where we kind of catalog various mental disorders. And it goes through various iterations. It changes over time. Disorders get added uh, and revised. Um, and that should happen because science is an iterative process and it's an evolving process. But we're still far from far, far away from understanding it perfectly. So then you'll get people like in the anti-psychiatry movement will saying, well, then we don't understand it at all. And then it doesn't exist. And that's just not true. That's simply not true at all. And I think that's, it's just, it's stunning to me because I would inv invite these people to, you know, shadow a, an inpatient psychiatric unit for a week and, and see, see really wonderful people who are suffering from the ravages of say a psychotic disorder yeah. and then tell us that 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 is just uh that it doesn't exist yeah yeah all right that's a good starting point what else you got what else do i got I'm, <laughs> I, <laughs> mount rushmore we got to have at least uh, you know two or three on here the homeopathy one is my favorite too um so i, I briefly mentioned that how there's no you know homeop homeopathic remedy doesn't have any active ingredient in it whatsoever these things are sold at like shoppers drug mart or local pharmacies um alongside other kind of remedies and so what people are buying when they buy a homeopathic remedy is water or sugar or sometimes alcohol or other kind of uh, adulterants in it but it's not actually what's in there uh maybe one to add to the mount rushmore my favorite homeopathic remedy is something called berlin wall pills which is uh you could find this i think it was used it was even used in the UK. There's some articles on it where the, the the British royal family were using these Berlin wall pills, or at least they they advertised it. Um, but it's the idea that um, someone should take these Berlin wall pills because it will help treat their emotional barriers somehow. I can't even. <laughs> I don't even want to pretend to know the logic of that, but even more absurd than taking a Berlin wall pill is taking a homeopathic Berlin wall pill because a homeopathic Berlin wall pill doesn't even have the Berlin wall in it because it's been diluted out of existence. To me, that's just asinine. Um, yeah. So that's up there. What's another one? Past life regression therapy is up there too. That drives me bonkers because it's actually still, it's promoted widely uh, there was a, a guy named Brian L. Weiss, who's a, a psychiatrist, and he's he's promoted it widely. So what past life regression therapy is, is that let's say you have post-traumatic stress disorder um, and, you know, you pick up one of his books or you go to a past life regression therapist and they're going to hypnotize you to a point in time uh, into a past life or many different past lives where you experience that trauma. And then you're supposed to somehow resolve the trauma from when you lived in the 1600s, um, from when you died some bizarre way, and that's going to help your post-traumatic stress disorder. So I, I'm laughing. I'm laughing at the absurdity of it. And at the same time, like it's, it's serious harm because, you know, people with PTSD suffer and they suffer badly. And I, I can't stand that kind of emotional and financial exploitation of people. So the treatment is hilarious and stupid, but the marketing of it is, is wrong. Mm -hmm. So that's up there. And then you got the, you know, the testicles tanning and then the, the butthole tanning <laughs> promoted by Tucker Carlson and kind of all those kind of wellness trends, which is again, equally absurd. <laughs> yeah. That'll have to be your, 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 Post book edition is the updates of the Mount Rushmore ridiculousness uh, mountain. I love that question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. Any final words of wisdom? Anything I didn't tee up where you're like, oh, Brad, you forgot to ask me about this. This is such a key area. Throw it out there. The table is yours. Uh, thanks, Brad. No, I, th I think we covered everything. I'm so honored, honored to be on your podcast. And I thought it was uh, a great chat. And I guess the, the the message that we're both kind of driving home here at the end is just for people to essentially, w w there's a lot of crap out there in the world, mm. a lot of misinformation and pseudoscience. And unfortunately, uh, especially in the area of mental health, it can be a very uh, 
what's called caveat emptor or buyer beware approach. And so what that means is we just need people to essentially take their health and their mental health into their own hands by getting back to those basics, as you said, eating well, sleeping well, exercising, but then also seeking bona fide people who can actually help with their problems. If someone's experiencing real mental disorders, you know, go, go to mental health professionals to help manage that and to do their best to increase science and mental health literacy skills. Yeah, love it. Great job. Thanks, man. Thanks, Brad. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Good stuff from Dr. Stay. As mentioned, we'll have a link to his website so you can pick up his book, or easily tap into other resources. If you've been considering pursuing your MBHWSC approved coach certification, the national board certification we talked about, with a program rated number one by Fortune Magazine, we have just one more cohort taking place in 2024. All the details on our Institute site, catalystcoachinginstitute.com, or email us anytime with questions. Results at catalystcoachinginstitute.com anytime. And now, it's time to be a Catalyst. This is Catalyst Coaching 360's Dr. Brad Cooper. Make it a great rest of your week, and I'll speak with you soon on the next episode of the Catalyst 360 podcast, or maybe over on the YouTube coaching channel.